sweet savor. Sweet savor is that that induces the good pleasure of Almighty God. Don't ever forget that. I'm going to say it again. Sweet savor on your part is what induces the goodwill and pleasure of Almighty God concerning you. Open your Bibles, if you would, to the great book of Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. <clears throat> As we begin a study, what is it that God really likes? What brings his blessings down on you as a person and your, your nation, your community, and so forth? Um, Noah has um, been on the ark for quite some time. God is releasing him now and letting he and the animals go ashore. And he said, go there, multiply, be fruitful. So we pick it up in the, um, in the 18th verse of the great chapter 8. In the great book of Genesis, which means in the beginning. Verse 18 reads, And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. 19. Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth, after their kinds went forth <clears throat> out of the ark. 20. And Noah built an ark, altar unto the Lord. Who did he build this to? He built it unto the Lord. And he took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. This would be the first sacrifice after the flood. Now let me ask you a question. Did God tell him to build this altar? No, he didn't. He did it from his heart. He did it because he loves the Father. He did it because he was appreciative. God had had him load extra clean animals into the ark, as you know. Only two of each of the unclean. And this would be the first sacrifice. But he was being loyal, and he was showing his love to Almighty God. And uh, <clears throat> so he built this place to thank God and have God's altar, a place to worship him there. 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. It pleased him. This means it had a fantastic odor and aroma of restfulness uh, in the Hebrew tongue. And the Lord said in his heart, this is what even the Lord was thinking, you understand? He said it in his mind. I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil. From his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Now, a lot of people worry about global warming and many other things. Who do you believe, God or people? God or the traditions of men? Naturally, we're going to go with the Father. Listen to the next verse carefully. While the earth remaineth, that's all the way to the end times. It still does. Seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, that means you're going to have winter and summer, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So when, when they start putting this malarkey about global warming, remember God's promise. He said, I'm not going to do that again, nor will I allow it. But again, the subject, what caused him to make that promise that you can have the assurance today that there's not going to be another flood. As a matter of fact, in another place, he'll tell you that every time you see the rainbow, that's his promise to you, that he's not going to destroy the earth with water anymore. That's, that's a promise. He always keeps his word. He even tells you in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26, remind me of my promises. Let's talk about them so that I can justify you. That means make it right with you. And so it is that he gives us this beautiful earth. And though, you know, uh, there's global warming. It happens every spring. Thank goodness. And there's global cooling. And we could use a little of it. It always comes on in the winter. It's the seasons. You're always going to have them. Why? Because of the sweet savor that went up from that altar to God. After he had destroyed with the flood, man, 
There was one man that loved him enough that, and with his blessings that he built an altar and whereby God could be thanked and worshiped. Again, sweet savor induces good pleasure and will from God. Anytime you get down and out and you think you've been mistreated or something, I don't know how long has it been since you sprinkled a little sweet savor on your heavenly father. I'm not talking about man. I'm talking about almighty God. See, he loves you and he understands. And that's what sweet savor is about. Is, and if our nation ever needed that sweet savor, it's now. We need that. We sure do to present it to God whereby we are blessed. Okay, with that, let's turn to the great book of Isaiah, chapter 65. Isaiah, chapter 65, I always like to give a little reverse of what man can do and how he gets in trouble. Um, God has really kind of roughed him up a little bit. It's not compared to how his wrath, his, the vials of wrath will be at the end, but it's kind of like it. He's giving them the reason he's upset. And so it's always good to keep that in mind, to know what pleases him, but also to know what upsets him. Chapter 65, the great book of Isaiah, verse 1. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, and behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. They even tried to knock my name out of being. Verse 2. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. God always loves his children. He tries which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Not God's teaching, not God's work, but their own little miserable ways. Verse 3, a people that provoketh me to anger, they insult me is what God is saying, continually to my face. And that sacrificeth in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. Instead of the golden altar, they like to worship anywhere in groves or anywhere where Satan might be present. Uh, which remain among the graves, they, out there with the tombs where the dead are, and lodge in the monuments, past memories, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things in their vessel is in their vessels uh, and not following any law that God has given even down to the health laws. Verse 5, which say, stand by thyself, come not near to me, for I am holier than thou. These are a smoke in my nose. Do you want to know what a sweet savor is? This is the opposite of it. A smoke in my nose of fire that burneth all the day. Six, behold, it is written. Before me I will keep silent, but with recompense, even recompense unto their bosom. I'm going to straighten their case out. I'm going to punish them. Seven, your, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense, upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore will I measure their former work unto their bosom. They're going to get the full measure. I'm going to give them everything they got coming to them. Beloved, if you ever took a warning from God, stay out of the way of this. Don't be a part of it. Don't participate in it with them. Separate yourself as one of God's elect. Let him know that you love him. Keep the sweet savor flowing, which induces the good pleasure and kindness of Almighty God for not only you, but your whole family. Verse 8, 
Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. He always protects his elect. That's his promise also. I don't know, are you one of his elect? Do you know that the false Christ comes first? Do you set yourself apart? Then you have the loving arm of God around you and your family. Otherwise, this world is kind of going absolutely the opposite direction from what it should. We had one governor that held a special prayer service to pray for all leaders and so forth, as the good word advises us to. He was mocked, ridiculed, parades in uh, disrespect to it, and yet at the same time, how do you think that made our father feel when he looked down on a nation and saw this transpiring that people would curse a day of prayer? A day of prayer to him. I'm sure he's not happy about it. And I'm sure that there will be some correction coming. Verse 9, And I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it. Is your name on that list? I hope it is. It's simply to love him and follow him. And my servant shall dwell there. He guarantees that. Even in all the turmoil that's going on in this world today, don't let them see you sweat. Okay. Keep straight ahead. Keep straight on. And know Father loves you. When you give Him sweet savor, He's going to bless you. That induces His loving kindness, whereby He touches you and your family and brings that peace of mind. Verse 10, and Sharon, that, that means out on the plains, shall be a fold of flocks in the valley of Achor. Achor means trouble. Even in that big old troubled up valley of trouble, a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people, they have sought me. Those that ask for him. That, that's important. Don't, don't read over that. His elect sought him. They look for Almighty God to worship, to love, to show and prepare that sweet savor whereby he could reach and touch and bring that peace into the family and into the people. Verse 11, but ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain and that prepare a table for that troop and that furnished the drink offering unto that number. In other words, you're looking forward to the first Messiah that comes. And you're preparing for it. Fly away. Going to gather with him. Going to have it made. We worship him. You want to be real careful who you worship in this generation. For Satan wants to be worshipped. And you know something? He looks an awful lot like Messiah. He comes prepared and, and uh, disguised as an angel of light. He transforms himself into that, but he's still the same old wicked killer. One that brings death and deception, and misguides. Seek the true Father through the true word. Hear that word. Live it. Bring a sweet savor to Almighty God by letting him know you love him. And let him touch you and your family and guide you. Be an inheritor, as the elect are, of his good grace. Because you provide that sweet savor. Verse 12, therefore will I number you to the sword, certain part. And you shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear but did evil before mine eyes and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Just get away from me. I'm holier than you are. I'm steeped in the traditions of men that make void the word of God. Don't come close to me. Don't rock my boat. 
Don't bring the new covenant, the blood covenant of the cross, the true Christ, into our midst. That's what you're going to hear. You could be lonely except for one thing. You've got God with you. Why? Because you provide that sweet savor that he finds restful, fragrant, desirable. And he touches you, your family, and you are an inheritor of Almighty God. He owns everything. You have nothing to fear but fear itself in ignorance of not understanding God's word. 13, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, my servant shall eat, but you shall be hungry. God's always going to feed his own. Behold, my servant shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but you shall be ashamed. In other words, we're talking here spiritual food as well as provisions. I will always provide them with the truth when the moment is right. When the time is right and they need more information, I'm going to provide it. That's why we have Passovers. That's why we have fall fellowships. It is the very hand of God bringing forth the deeper truth and knowledge that not necessarily deeper, but timely, whereby we are guided, whereby we know how to provide that sweet savor and to be blessed from the living God. Yeah, they're, they're starving all right. They're misled, misguided. One of Christ's first warnings in Mark 13 and Matthew 24 is don't let man deceive you for many will come in my name. A lot of coming, a lot coming in my name claiming to be Christian preachers. Don't let Christian preachers that just come in his name and do not bring his word. And let me take it one step deeper. Do not bring sweet savor. Avoid. Verse 14. Behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart, but you shall, be, you shall cry for sorrow of heart and shall howl for vexation of spirit. Going to be broken. And you shall leave your name for a curse upon my chosen, for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. That other name is married. It's he Hezbollah. Okay. And so it is. Father loves his children that leave a sweet savor for him. Now turn with me to the great book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 20. Verse 27, another event of the same thing, a same likeness. Let's read it. Verse 27, Ezekiel chapter 20. Therefore, son of man, speak unto the house of Israel. That's his own people. And say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me in that they have committed a trespass against me. When you start worshiping a false messiah, that's a terrible trespass. Some people can pass that off very lightly. It's not lightly. It is certainly the opposite of sweet savor to Almighty God. Verse 28, For when I had brought them into the land for the which I lifted up mine hand to give it to them, to protect them, then they saw every high hill and all the thick trees, and they offered there their sacrifices, not to God. And there they presented the provocation of their offering. There also they made their sweet savor. Who did they make it to? Sweet savor and poured out their, their, their drink offerings, not to God but to anything but false teaching, false leadership. 29, listen carefully and learn from the word of God. Then I said unto them, 
what is the high place where unto you go? Think about it. That's God asking. And the name thereof is called Bama unto this day. Do you know what Bama means being translated? It means a filthy place of worship, a high place, anything other than God. And God doesn't like it. Verse 30. Wherefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers? Haven't you learned anything yet? And commit ye whoredoms after their abominations, worshiping false teachings? For when ye offer your gifts, when you make your sons to pass through the fire, you pollute yourselves with all your idols, even unto this day. And shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel, as I live? Saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. You know, ultimately in the old days, they practiced Molochism, which is they actually passed their children through the fire. You know, that, that destroyed them, yes, the flesh body. But today it's worse. They caused their children to pass through the fire of deception into worshiping the first Messiah that appears to haul them out, get on his wagon. We're dealing here with their destroying their children's souls by false teaching, just opposite of the sweet savor Worshiping on Bama, the high hill that leads away from the true word of God and the true worship of God that has anything but the sweet savor that induces the good pleasure of the living God. I don't know. And you think God's going to bless a group like that? I think not. They're going to get exactly what they've got coming to them. Thank God for the millennium because they are children of God and they will be taught how precious the word of God is. He will not be inquired of by false traditions where there is no sweet savor. And that which cometh into your mind shall, this is verse 32, shall not be at all that you say, we will be as the heathen, as the families of the countries, to serve wood and stone. Well, thank God we don't do that, do we? Well, don't we? I don't know. Uh, how much political correctness do you practice? Well, we'll just go along with it. It'll be okay. Don't offend anyone. Why not? If it's a lie, it's a lie, an abomination, and it should be declared, and a sweet savor should go up if you want the blessings of God. You can't go along with the party. Always judge by facts. A spade is a spade, period. No ifs, no ands, no maybes. Judge by facts. Don't let somebody pull the wool over your eyes because there are experts out there that would love to do nothing better. They'll lie to you. Uh, you know, they will start more stories about this ministry than you can shake a stick at. And if you're fool enough to believe them, join that crowd. That's good, okay? Or stick to the word of God and be blessed. It's up to you. It's your ship, you sail it. Keep it off the rocks. Provide the sweet savor and God will bless you. Verse 33, As I live, saith the Lord, God surely, with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out, will I rule over you. You want to know who boss is? You don't have to worry about it. It's him. It's our father. It's a lot better to have him pleased with you than it is ticked. 34, and I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. Well, when does God's fury come? The vials. 
you, you wake up, come on with me, okay? When the vials are poured out, that is the wrath of God. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face. Boy, are you going to get a lecture straight on. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. You know, God sends teachers, and he doesn't send mamby pambiers. First on this hand and maybe on that hand. No, it's the word of God. Take it or leave it. It is the word of God. You will declare it. You will provide that sweet savor if you want his blessings or join the other crowd. It's your choice. It's your pick. You sail your own ship. It is yours, 37, and I will cause you to pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Thank God he uses agricultural term, uh, terms. To pass, do you know why that, uh, the shepherd carried his staff, a rod? Well, so the sheep passed under. He knows them. He knows who's supposed to go under and who he puts the hook to. And if, if you make it under the rod, you're one of his. If he puts the hook to you, you belong to the other group. Do you know probably why? All your life, you never were too concerned about providing sweet savor to your own Father, Almighty God. It's important. It is primary. If you want His blessings, then you'll remember that. You will always provide that sweet savor that induces His good pleasure. That brings His blessings, and then indeed you are blessed. He has the power and the authority to see to that. And he never, ever lets down those that come with that sweet savor, knowledge, wisdom. He feeds you the word of God, whereby you have the depth and the meaning to make a difference. As salt makes something saltier, you with sweet savor sweeten Life itself, which brings pleasure not only from God, but to those that are, are around you. He has that rod. He's going to use it, that staff. Verse 38. And I will purge out from among you the rebels. They're gone. And them that trespass against me. I will bring them forth out of the country where they sojourn. And they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And so it is. That's why sweet savor is ever, ever so important. As for you, O house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Go ye and serve ye every one his idols. And go to that high hill and worship it. And hereafter also, if you will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. Don't call me your father. If that's what you're going to do. Okay. Verse 40. And in mine holy mountain, and in the mountain of the height of Israel, saith the Lord God, there shall all the house of Israel, all of them in the land, serve me. There will I accept them, and there will I require your offering the first fruits and your oblations with all your holy things. That is to say your love for him. He requires it. Why? He's your father. And he wants that love returned that he provides for you. And he wants it returned with a sweet savor. Not a bunch of malarkey griping. God, why did you do this? Why did you do that? If you're going to have that attitude, you'd be probably be better off not to talk to him. Because he'll, he'll answer you. He'll tell you why. He'll show you in your own life. He'll turn your little old life upside down and crossways. Take a sweet savor and be blessed. 41, I will accept you with your sweet savor. When I bring you out from the people and gather you out of the countries, wherein you have been scattered, and I will be sanctified in you before the heathen. It is as a teaching element to bring forth that word of truth, that sweet savor, so that others can see 
and know and understand. The real thing is important, beloved. The real thing is that sweet savor. It's done by loving him who has done so much for you and put it right there for you. All you have to do is be on his side. Let him know you love him. That's how easy it is to please him. But mostly don't follow after nonsense. Don't follow after false teachings and traditions of men. It angers him. That's, that's kind of easy to remember. If you want to be blessed of God, you'll always remember it. 42, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I shall bring you into the land of Israel, into the country for the which I lifted up mine hand to give it to your fathers. And there shall you remember your ways and all your doings wherein you have been defiled. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for all your evils that you have committed. There is a time of teaching coming. And that uh, the teaching has begun for God's elect. But the elect must teach others as it is written. And so it is. One final uh, chapter. Go to the New Testament, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In closing. Second Corinthians chapter two, verse 10. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Don't ever forget that. We're talking new covenant here, new blood covenant. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. If you've studied his word, you know what his tricks are. Don't ever, ever fall for them. Or, or you're to be shamed. Verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas, that's to say Troy, to preach Christ's gospel, and the door was opened to me of the Lord, 13, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus, my brother, but Taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. I went out to find him, looking for a brother. Now thanks be unto God, which always, I want to repeat that, always causes us to triumph in Christ. How do you triumph? In Christ. And make it manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. That beautiful, restful seva. Do you understand seva means, that sweet means rest also? And that's akin to Sabbath. Sabbath is rest, resting in him. He needs a little rest too sometimes. And that's you giving him rest. Verse 15, listen very carefully. For we are unto God a sweet seva of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Even in those that are going to go down in the pit, you are a sweet savor in Christ because you're saved. You're knowledgeable. You know about the false teaching. You know the tricks of Satan. And you always, even with that having been said, provide that sweet savor for Almighty God. 16. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? You are, if you believe. Okay. For we are not as many which corrupt, that's adulterate, mix it up, the word of God. But as of sincerity, this word sincerity means it is transparent, pure till sun can shine through it. Uh, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Many will be uh, confused about death unto death, and 
And in Matthew chapter 24, along what, about 21, somewhere along there, the stone the builders rejected, that's Christ. Those that fall on him are broken, meaning the old man is broken up, it changes you. But those that that stone falls on, which is Christ, are turned to powder. So the truth turns the hearts of the children back to the fathers, plural either to the living God or to Satan. The truth will drive some to death because they choose wrongly, and the truth will drive others to eternal life. Those that provide a sweet savor. Let me even rephrase that statement in the new blood covenant. In Christ, you are a sweet savor when you follow him, listen to him, or are guided by him and care about the other children that are misled, that are going to be ground to powder because there's still the millennium coming. Going to be some shaking up. A sweet savor to Almighty God. That's what he wants from you. He wants to hear from you. That is what turns loose his love, his compassion, his blessings, always by sweet savor. And it is amplified a thousand times when that sweet savor is in Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for the precious word. Thank you, Father. And may we provide that sweet savor, Father, that pleases you, that releases your goodwill to this ministry as it always does, Father. For we are so blessed by you and we love you for it, Father. And may it be a sweet savor to you as we strive and continue that work, Father, of reaching the lost, confused world and bring as many as we can into that sweet savor. We thank you in advance in Yahshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Okay. Then certainly your, your recreation money is yours to do with as you please. As long as you don't sin with it. And that's not a sin. Uh, uh, Vanessa from Georgia. The Bible says an eye for an eye is my son's death because of the death I caused people uh, absolutely not. Okay, don't don't put yourself on a guilt trip like that. I, I want Vanessa. I want you to make a note of Luke chapter thirteen. I want you to read it carefully. Let me explain just a little bit of it. <clears throat> there were a group of um, God's children killed because they got caught up in a snare. And then, secondly, there was the Tower of Siloam. It fell over on 18 people and killed them dead or in a hammer. And Christ asked, were they bigger sinners than anyone else? And the answer, no. It was an accident. Accidents happen, and accidents are accidents, period. End of the story. Don't put yourself on a guilt trip, okay? Uh, Maxine from Oklahoma, can you please tell me if the scripture God hated Esau or God hated Esau while he was still in his mother's womb are in the Bible? Absolutely. But this, this is what documents the first earth age, quite frankly. God is always fair in everything. He was fair even in hating Esau in his mother's womb. Why? 
Well, because of what he did in the first earth age. And if we judge him or if we measure his actions in this earth age, probably not any different than what it was in the first, he, he didn't care anything about God. <clears throat> he sold his inheritance for a bowl of mush. I, I mean, inherit, he was supposed to inherit the whole thing. I mean, his first fruits. He sold it for a bowl of mush. Uh, you'll not only find it in Romans chapter 13, but you will find it in the first chapter of Malachi, the last great book of the Old Testament, and how precious it is that our Father gives us these truths whereby we even kind of can see what happened in the first earth age. Quite frankly, whatever you are born into, you deserve it because you earned it from that first earth age. Now, the beauty is that in Christ you can always work yourself out of it and up. You don't have to stay there. And that's why God loves his children. And certainly that's what makes life so wonderful. And, and that's why God's elect chosen before the foundations, they fought against Satan when he first rebelled. They're going to do it again. That's why God chose them as elect, because he knows he can count on them. Uh, Willie and Ruby from Mississippi. Did the giants or other races enter into the ark through the animals since they were only eight Adamic? No, they're Adamic. Okay, it means of Adam, Adam, F Ha Adam, souls on the ark. No, wh what did God say in Genesis six? There were no giants there at that time, but He said, "Take two of every flesh." There were Kenites. He took. The two of them aboard the ark, naturally. That was God's orders. Since Eve is the mother of all creation, man and sin nature came through the fall of Adam and Eve. How did the six day creation obtain the sin nature? How is it uh, she is their mother? She's not. Eve is the mother of all living for only one reason. Through her, through Mother Eve, would come the Son of God. That's why that genealogy is so protected throughout the manuscripts. Okay. But Mother Eve, through her umbilical cord to umbilical cord, would come Christ. And if you're not in Him, you're not living. You're going to die. Therefore, Eve becomes the mother of all living, not through the womb but through the Son that would come from the womb, which is to say the Lord Jesus Christ, that brings eternal life. As far as the six-day creation, don't worry, they're humans. They have, they have uh, and, and humans sin. Humans fall short. They don't need any help, and they don't need an excuse to blame it on somebody else. Uh, Satan was with them, and... He was more subtle than any living being, properly translated, on earth. He fooled them, in other words. Uh, Marsha from Kentucky. Who is Michael the archangel? And please give me some verses to read. Um, Michael the archangel is like Gabriel the archangel. What does Gabriel mean? It means man of God. Well, why would he call an angel a man? Because he was man of God. Who is Michael? Who is like Yah? That's what it means. Chapter 10, the great book of, of uh, Daniel, will tell you a great deal about uh, Michael. Chapter 12 of Daniel will actually tell you who Michael was. <clears throat> he is kind of the archangel of Israel. And some people make a serious mistake in calling Michael Christ. That's angel worship, and that's a serious, serious sin. That is one thing that God is much against is angel worship. He was a servant of the living God. He is the chief prince of the house of Israel. He is that archangel. You see, there are angels, and then there are archangels. Archangels are never, ever born of woman. 
Christ was born of woman because he, they were included. But we have that set of archangels that do God's bidding, and so it is. Uh, Muriel from Florida, if you, if you are not to judge what happens when you are called to, if you are not to judge what happens when you are called to be a juror, that, that's part of, that, that, that's good, that's biblical. If you are to judge by, uh, you are even told, two witnesses. Don't ever judge somebody on one witness. That's, that's, what, that's jury work. It's, it's biblical, and there's nothing wrong with it. You are a, a set of peers, and you listen for, and as God would have you, you call it the way the facts determine. Uh, with the dual witness uh, system. Monique from California, what is the origin of Christianity? Well, th now that is a difficult question. Naturally, the origin of Christianity is Christ, okay? Because Christianity means Christ man. It means a human being that worships and follows the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, naturally, it began after um, people would worship him. You've read in this great book of Mark how many people followed him and worshiped him, some of them just because of the deeds he did. But Christianity is the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, Tom from uh, California, my question is, is how does one know if they are one of God's elect? Well, it's really pretty simple. There, there's, there, it, it, it does not make us special or anything of that nature, but usually a pretty strong indication is if you are aware that the false Christ comes first and you're going to make a stand against him, then it's pretty certain that you are one of God's elect. Unfortunately, most people, or fortunately, I should say, do not, they do not have eyes to see or to understand. And ignorance, I guess, is bliss, but they're not accountable and will be taught in the millennium if, if they cannot see it. I can say that quite frankly because, as it is written in Romans chapter 11, God sent the spirit of slumber, or the Greek is specific stupor, on a lot of people. You can see it. You, you go to airports or any other place and look at the faces of people. They're in a stupor. They have no conception of what is truly happening in this world, though it's written right here. They're biblically illiterate. And that stupor is upon them. And if you tried to talk to them and tell them the truth, they, they would buzz you off. They, got, they don't have time for you. They don't have time for truth. They're busy, busy, busy. But as knowing that truth, that the faults comes first and you're gonna make that stand, pretty well guarantees you're one of God's elect. Jane from Nebraska, uh, when you say the Kenites survived the flood of Noah, does this mean they were Kenites aboard the ark? That's what I mean. There were eight Adamic souls but God also said, take two of every flesh aboard the ark. Kenites were flesh, and so it is. You can read in Gen that same chapter in Genesis chapter 6. Let me think for a moment real quickly. Verse 3, I'm going to say. It says, it grieved God that he had made man flesh also. It really did. It still is even in, because flesh is habitual. It wants to fall down. Sin, in other words. But, but he said in this same chapter, take two of every flesh aboard that ark. They have a purpose. For every negative, there is a positive, and for every positive, there is a negative. John from Pennsylvania, could you please explain Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32? Is there forgiveness or no forgiveness? I feel I have committed this, and it has haunted me my whole life. There is no possibility that you could have committed the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin can only be committed by God's elect 
when they stand before the false messiah. The false messiah hasn't come yet. That's why I can say you have not committed it. That would be impossible. You may have cursed or something like that. Get over it. Okay, Repent and that's the end of it. But it is unpardonable to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, refusing him to speak through you when you're delivered up before the false messiah. So sleep good tonight. Have a good night's rest. You're in good shape. Um, Veronica uh, from Florida. Veroni, I should say, okay, from Florida. If you are crippled and can't get around, will God hold it against you if you can't get to church but you watch it over TV? Well, th you're, you're in church. Shepherd's Chapel is a church. And you're in church when you study the Word of God, even over television. Quite frankly, um, and I don't say this as a boast, but you will probably learn more Bible right here than you would in a lot of church houses. Okay. And a church is where God's Word is taught. So you're in good shape. Don't ever, God does never, never holds one being handicapped against someone. He loves them. That's why he healed many people. Jack from, Calif from Georgia. Where in the Bible does it say, I am against those who teach my people to fly? In Ezekiel chapter 13, following verse 20. If you have a newer translation of the King James called the NIV, it's been changed. Little, little scribes changed the truth from God saying, I'm against those that teach my children to fly to save their souls to a little statement about birds flying. You know, isn't that brilliant? I mean, you know, a child can understand that the scribes have changed it and, and for the worse because they hide the truth in doing this. Um, this is why that I'm against most of the newer, I say newer translations, because they've been hankied with. The old one has been hankied with enough. That's why teachers are necessary, is to help spot where the Kenites have kind of scribed out what should be written or translated from the original. Thank God we have the original whereby in the Masara, whereby we can fix it. Steve from California, if the devil knows he's going to, to the lake of fire, why does he even bother to try and deceive people? Hey, don't ever underestimate the devil. He's doing pretty good. I mean, he believes he's so good and so presentable that he can deceive most of the world. And do you know something? He's accomplished it. Look around you. How many people do you know that you can actually sit down and have a decent biblical conversation with and they know what you're talking about? Or are they ready to jump on the first wagon that flies out of here? That's Satan. I mean, hey, the old boy's doing pretty good as far as loading his wagon up. And, um, he feels he can, uh, as it's written in Daniel chapter 11, he worships the God of force. And he's got the numbers and that's force. Joseph from Georgia, when you speak of the trumps, I believe it's an event, not an actual trumpet sounding. Am I right? And if so, would you please document? Well, it's, it's, you're right, and, in, and it needs no documentation other than the fact that the seals go where? Revelation 7 tells you, in the minds of people. The seals are the seal of God. It's God's truth, letting you know the chronological order of events. So, no, you're not going to hear a trumpet sound, but you know what happens in each trumpet. It's an actual fact, and then you know that trump has sounded or that seal has come to pass, or that vial, the wrath of God, has been poured out. 
Uh, Martha from Oklahoma, please explain Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, where it says caught up in the clouds and, uh, uh, and uh, the, and the uh, work air, the word air. The word air is air, and it means the breath of life. It means you're changed into a spiritual body. Um, you can never understand 416 without going back to where the subject starts. This is where most people make a mistake in studying God's Word. Well, what does 13 and 14 say? It says, if you believe Christ rose from the dead, and you'd better or you're not a Christian, then you better believe all those that sleep in Him, that is to say that have passed on, are already risen also. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. They have risen also. There is no way we that remain can precede the dead because they rise first, meaning they're already gone. They're out of here. And at the last trump, that's the seventh, that's when Christ returns, then we will all be changed into spiritual, uh, uh, breath of life bodies, spiritual, and join Him. He, uh, Paul was a teacher of colloquial Greek. He was a Hebrew scholar. And the colloquial saying is like a cloud of birds, a cloud of grasshoppers, a cloud of Christians. That's what it is. Okay, I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, most of all. God loves you for it, makes His day. And when you, I'm talking about you, make God's day, it's going to please Him, and boy, is He going to make yours. He's going to love you for it. We're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. But there's one thing that's most important, and you listen to me and you listen good. You stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.